We're back. We're back. We're talking about the beats, and we're back. We're back. <laughs> Da -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. I, I'm gonna work on that. I'm still workshopping that. Yeah, I'm still yeah. workshopping that number. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty good. Yeah, I imagine yeah. you just have a suitcase and you're on a corner somewhere in downtown Wake Forest. <laughs> I am, and I, I do a little shuffle off to Buffalo, and then oh, I'm sure you do. I do some windmills. You know, I like to tap windmills. <laughs> Woo! I'm doing it now. I'm throwing my hands up. I don't. In your room, you shouldn't throw your hands around anywhere because you'll probably hit something, and then yeah, it won't work right. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Elliot and Todd. Welcome to Two Designers Walk Into a Bar, an ongoing conversation about pop culture and iconic design. Today we're going to take a step back in time and into a bar from the past as we rub elbows with the beats. We may be in Greenwich Village. We could be in North Beach. Wherever our bar is for you, it's home to the hippest cats and the coolest kittens. So ask the bartender for some reasonably priced Chianti, wave the cigarette smoke away from your face, and dig the crazy scene right alongside us here in the bar. Uh, so we're picking back up about the beats, right? Yeah, uh, we left off. You talked about Jack Kerouac on the road, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. um, we used the word seminal, which makes us smart, and um, yeah, learned a lot about authors. I think actually, didn't we use the word pre-seminal? Oh, that which is even smarter, right? Uh, it all depends what you're talking about. <laughs> Not that stuff. Oh no. Oh. Okay. All right. So, what else you got? Well, speaking of getting excited, I oh, have... Oh, <laughs> yeah, this is good. Yeah, look at the time. Look yeah. at the time. <clears throat> Why is everyone <laughs> leaving? No one said last call. <laughs> okay. So, um, last time we talked about the release of On the Road and how Jack Kerouac sort of instinctively knew even though the book was a tremendous success, it was sort of the beginning of the end for him a little bit. Yeah. And this was, obviously the release of On the Road was a big moment in, um, in pop culture history. And I would like today to talk about another one that was equally uh, sort of a landmark moment and uh, sort of a bomb dropping in the world of art, okay. specifically visual art okay and that is the debut of jackson pollock's drip paintings and i oh. think when people tend to think about things like abstract expressionism or really what's pretty popular quote unquote for people who maybe don't have an art degree or don't frequent art museums i would say if we were to hold up a bunch of paint drips even if it's like a drop cloth after the painter in your house is done painting your walls and you were to take it to your neighbor and say, hey, what does this remind you of, right? They would probably say, ah, Jackson right. Pollock, right? Like, so this is a pretty And then they would be like, oh, thing. my kid could do that. Why exactly. is that so special? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Haven't we gotten some emails like that about this podcast? Yeah, yeah. Well, which is, you know, is bound to happen. Well, we're, we're known as the Jackson Pollocks of podcast hosts because we, <laughs> we make a big mess and it just ends up looking amateurish when we're all sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're smoking and drinking a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would really like to start, though, truly, in all seriousness, set the stage for this. I want to read an excerpt from the, a book that I love about this era called Birth of the Cool. And that was written okay. by Lewis McAdams. So, ahem. Ahem. Just like last time, if you will indulge me. Okay. Um, please in, indulge yourself. <laughs> While everyone else listens. Okay. Commence. The Rank Outsider. Dig Jackson Pollock in the August 8th, 1949 issue of Life magazine. In paint-spattered blue denims, his arms folded across his chest, 
and his sleeves rolled like he's ready to change your oil. An unfiltered cigarette dangles from the right corner of his mouth. He leans back, poised like a coiled spring against a wall on which he's tacked his 18-foot-long painting, Summertime, which he's just finished. His head is at a cocky fuck you and the horse he rode in on angle. His eyes, though, look puzzled. His brow is furrowed. He squints through the cigarette smoke as if he can't believe that anybody could possibly want to know where he's coming from or what he's gone through to get to where he is now. Mm -hmm. In color, when color was special, on page 42 of Life, his well-worn work boots cross between the words greatest and living in the headline, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? Hmm. Wow, no pressure, dude. Right? <laughs> yeah, similar in a lot of ways to our friend Kerouac. Jack Kerouac. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And they were about the same age when fame hit. So Kerouac was 35, uh, Pollock was 37. Um, so this article came out, and at this point, unlike Kerouac, arguably, who had really written on the road years before and was then shopping it around for a publisher, this was Pollock's moment. This was written when he truly was making some of the greatest paintings of his career, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we kind of loosely poked fun at these works of art, but these are amazing if you've ever had an opportunity to see them in person, right? These large layered webs of color and rhythm and line, much, much more complex than a lot of people give them credit for. And they're also called, of course, action painting, right? Mm -hmm. Because they track, the paint is really tracking his movements. And the premise of his work, not to get too deep into it, but, you know, I've suddenly turned into Cliff Clavin here at the bar a little bit, (laughs) is... uh, it's really the, the lines of paint across a canvas are an artifact or a trace of what he did with his body, right? And, right, and the movement right. of that, right? People either understood this or they, they didn't. So among the people who did understand was arts patron Peggy Guggenheim. So she really championed him. And then there was also an art critic in New York named Clement Greenberg, who, again, no pressure here, declared him to be, quote, the most powerful painter in contemporary America, unquote. Wow. <laughs> so pretty good, pretty good praise. Again, very similar to Kerouac's uh, book review, right? Um, but again, and Todd, I think we're going to start to notice a pattern here. Not everyone loved what he was up to. Really? So, uh, why is that? It sounds like he had a huge fan base of, of influential people. He did, um, but again, it was so radical and so outside the mainstream that a lot of people, I think, just thought it was bullshit. Like, they thought it was a oh, stunt, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. One great quote came from Lee Ashton, who was then the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, said of his work that it, quote, and you got to love the British, because even when the British insult you, it's like a backhanded <laughs> compliment. So yeah, so yeah, getting getting yeah. into this, getting into what this this insult, right? Ashton said that Pollock's work would, quote, make a most enchanting printed silk. And I could, I guess, say that with more of an accent. So, okay. yeah. It would make a most enchanting printed silk. So, you know, in other words, it was just like something that looked good on drapes. Like it couldn't be taken seriously. Yeah, decorative. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Time Magazine, not to be outdone, (laughs) Time Magazine, the same people who, who bagged on our buddy Jack Kerouac, they also ran an article that gave Jackson Pollock his uh, nickname, Jack the Dripper. <laughs> it's, you got him. It's pretty clever. Did, did they call up Truman Capote and say, what would you call him? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Clever. Listen, Smallman. yeah, listen, put down that pen and paper and uh, and pick up the phone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. I just love that. Jack the Dripper. Uh, but, you know, here's the thing. And and this is kind of when where where the road forks for uh, Kerouac versus Pollock, right? So Pollock really didn't give a shit. 
So he basically told, so so he was getting famous, so famous in fact, that a film crew came out to his house, like at the very end of Long Island. And this is well doc, you can see this film, but also the Ed Harris film, Pollock, they um, yeah. do a really good job with this story and they and they show scenes of this, the, the filming of the filming. <laughs> but he told filmmaker Hans uh, Namath uh, that when he was painting, quote, there is no accident, right? So in other words, his movements are so choreographed in his mind that he's just getting out what's there. So what what everyone else sees as sort of bullshit, you know, hip shots in terms of like whatever, he saw uh -huh. it as very, very choreographed. And you know what? Even his friends, his artist friends, his abstract expressionist friends, they debated whether his work was good or not, right? So even within the art community, even at the local... 24-hour coffee shops and diners in New York where these guys from the Art Student League would hang out. There wasn't even a, a, an opinion there. I know, Todd, it's shocking that a, a bunch of creative people that are very ego-driven and insecure couldn't come to a consensus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That doesn't sound like anybody that I've heard of at all. Yeah. So, wait, what do you mean by that? <laughs> keep, keep going. Oh, we're, we're okay. Good. Okay. So, basically... Long and the short of this, why is this a pop culture watershed moment, right? Because that Life article and coverage of Pollock's paintings really brought abstract expressionism into everyone's living rooms. Figuratively and sometimes literally, right? So it just created this moment where suddenly art, visual art, really mattered to everybody. Everybody was talking about it. Mm, okay. And that's why, like I said earlier, when your painter leaves a drop cloth behind, the first thing that pops into everyone's mind across multiple generations is, ah, oh, it reminds me of a Jackson Pollock painting. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it, we, it, we're familiar. It's a touchstone for us. Exactly. So you said he was in, he, his studio was in Long Island, right? Mm -hmm. Or on mm -hmm. Long Island. Um was he part of the the New York uh, art scene at that time as well, or was he an outsider? No, he was definitely part of the scene. As I mentioned, there was uh, Peggy Guggenheim. There was, you know, Clement Greenberg. He was really, in a lot of ways, I think he was sort of the the. He ended up being the sun that a lot of these people were were orbiting around. He he kind of oh, became a center okay. of gravity in a lot of ways, right? Okay, gotcha. So when you think about the beats, you tend to think about um, you think about literature, but of course that that wasn't true at all, right? You had all kinds of artists involved in this. You had musicians, as we'll get into, but also you had visual artists, right? So yeah, yeah, New York is certainly one of the cornerstones of this scene, the beat scene. So we talked a little bit in our last episode about Columbia University, how a lot of these folks met at Columbia. They were either students at Columbia, they were hanging around campus. And uh, and so definitely Columbia was a nucleus of a lot of this. And, and that's interesting, uh -huh. really in the sense of Going back to what we were talking about in our last episode when Madison Avenue got a hold of the beat generation and uh, turned them into beatniks, they were seen as very anti-intellectual, kind of dullards, you know, couldn't be bothered to think of anything, just very lazy. Mm -hmm. And really, of course, that, that wasn't true. You know, Columbia is a place that doesn't suffer fools, right? So right, uh, right. Ginsburg was there, Kerouac was there. These guys certainly knew something. Now, going back to Pollock for a second... You know, you also, of course, had Greenwich Village. Now, Todd, I know you of love course, Greenwich yeah. Village, right? So yeah, yeah. all of these guys were hanging around Greenwich Village. So I'm going to start with the beat writers. Yeah. Why were they in Greenwich Village? Like, how did they end up there? Well, it was really for a couple of reasons. One was uh, the rent was low. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so uh, I guess you could either live way out in the sticks or live in your car or, or you know, couch surf. But um, but just low rent meant that, you know, you had a possibility of living in the city where things were happening. And also this was, again, a neighborhood. So it was really like a small town within New York mm. City. Right. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you think about, again, the 50s and heading into the 60s, you think about folk music. So this was sort of peripherally happening. Um, you had readings, you had discussions that were going on at Washington Square Park, which is, of course, adjacent to NYU. So again, another institution. And then Ginsburg was a, a big part of, of the scene. He lived in the village. So was William Burroughs. He lived on, on Bedford Street. So this was like, uh, so I imagine that they were all part of coffee house culture in the village at that time as well, right? Because uh, I, I know that from the beats is, that's where you, I, I, I guess I know where I see people gathering, where people are discussing, where they're reading poetry, where they're listening to music. But it was, it was always like small kind of underground places. I was going to say that the, uh, the bars and uh, coffee shops were kind of their third place, but I'm not sure yeah. a lot of these people had jobs. <laughs> so that's it's, right. It's they didn't of, have a second place. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was their second place, I think, you yeah, know, yeah, right? That's right. Um, by default. And also, these bars and coffee houses were important because hosting readings, doing all this stuff, this was where they could, A, test out material, but B, sort of introduce themselves to a, a, a willing public right? Mm, Just by virtue yeah. of what's going on, culturally it was self-selecting, I would think, to a certain degree, right? If you didn't like smoke-filled bars, if you didn't like the chatter and, and energy of a coffee house, and you didn't like a bunch of people, you know, cheek by jowl, you know, kind of crowding into these little establishments, you weren't going to hang out there. You were busy out in the suburbs living Leave it to Beaver existence, right? Right, right. So you had uh, places like the San Remo Cafe on McDougal Street. You had um, Chumley's. You had the Minetta Tavern. So the the beat writers were hanging around here, but also our buddy Jackson Pollock. And so were Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein, all these abstract expressionists who were living and working in New York. So oh, okay. there's all this cross-pollination that's happening. Hi. We want to take a moment to mention that if you're enjoying this episode, we have an archive of topics ranging from the Olympics to movie posters. Think Ghostbusters. Iconic images. Think Bigfoot. Punk music. The Ramones. Saturday morning cartoons. The Pink Panther. And failed products like OK Soda. Visit our website at two designers walk into a bar.com for full episode notes and visuals, the latest blog content, and to sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Find the links on our website or search using the phrase two designers walk into a bar. Most importantly, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people like you find podcasts like this. And tell a friend about us. Send them a link to our podcast from your listening platform of choice. And if you're inclined, buy our merchandise. Stickers, coasters, magnets, t-shirts. We're designers. We make good stuff and it helps support the show. Get in touch. Use the contact form on our website or send an email to hello at two designers walk into a bar dot com. We read every message we get. Honest. And we're available for speaking gigs. Email us to learn more. Okay, now, back to the bar. Yeah, so it's kind of, if you think about it, um, the writing, the beats writing was less than traditionally structured. Um, it was sort of stream of consciousness, um, much like the visual art, too, um, with Pollock and... Um, de Kooning, it was kind of stream of consciousness. It was, they called it abstract expressionism, but it was, it was really about the process of capturing all of this stuff and, and documenting that it happened as opposed to something that would be beautiful to hang over your couch. Right, exactly. Because a lot of these folks, they weren't even in the market for a couch. <laughs> they had no interest yeah, in it, yeah. unless it was someone else's couch where they could crash for the night. Or in the case of uh, some of these uh, hangers-on, these core hangers-on that uh, 
were fencing stolen goods like our Herbert Hunky <laughs> that <laughs> hid, hid a bunch in uh, Ginsburg's apartment, probably among other places under his couch. Um, <laughs> yeah, like these guys just didn't really care about that. It just simply didn't compute. Now, I love the fact that you mentioned things that were seemingly unstructured, things that were much right, more right. emotive and um, spontaneous. Because really, when you think about that in terms of music, what do you think about? Uh, jazz. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah like, but, I mean, maybe it's because we're talking about that era, but I think of that, like, what is it called? Bebop jazz? Yeah, yeah. Something bebop, like hard bop, all that sort of thing. Like the Charlie Parkers, the Dizzy Gillespie's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The John Coltrane. So this jazz movement was also going on. Blue Note Records was in New York, right? That's where it began. So uh -huh, this uh -huh. is all starting to germinate. You have all these seeds that are planted in the soil. Now, as I mentioned before, this wasn't confined only to New York. These folks also went to other parts of the country. I mentioned San mm -hmm. Francisco. I mentioned City Lights Bookstore, where Lawrence Ferenghetti was a champion of the work these guys were doing. And uh, they, he published Howl, of course, in 1956. Mm -hmm. And these guys originally made it out to um, San Francisco, again, because of <laughs> our our bus driver from our last episode, uh, Neil Cassidy. Neil, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had gone out to San Francisco with one of his, uh, his lady friends, so uh, Ginsburg went out there to visit him because, of course, he had met Neil Cassidy through Jack Kerouac and blah, 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 blah. One would go someplace and then they all would loosely sort of start to, to follow them. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so uh, New York and San Francisco were kind of the, uh, the co-headquarters of... The, the beat scene? Yeah, you could say that. So again, City Lights Bookstore is is a really good center of gravity for the beats, right? So that's in North Beach. So that's this neighborhood that has a lot of coffee houses, a lot of cafes. And in fact, it was in San Francisco at an establishment called Six Gallery that the first public reading of Howl happened. So oh, okay. that was, Ginsburg did that. So that was even before it was published. So that event was a success and the evening led to many more readings um, by other famous poets. So I don't know how hard of an act Ginsburg was to follow, but you know, I can't imagine it would have been easy, but I think he really kicked open the door with his powerful poem for mm -hmm. a lot of other folks to come in. Again, you sort of have this this willing audience. Yeah, yeah. And again, keep in mind soon after that, there was the obscenity trial that we talked about with Hal in our last episode, oh, right? right? Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So naturally, that's going to bring national attention, right? Where is this happening? Oh, San Francisco? Well, we need to be there. And then slightly outside of San Francisco proper in a, a town called Mill Valley, I mentioned the exploration of Eastern religions. And um, the Beats found this guy named Gary Snyder, and he was kind of the Thoreau of the Beats. And he was studying Zen, and he had lived in Japan. And so he was sort of seen as kind of a, a little bit of a domestic yogi for these guys, right? So yeah, yeah. if you, again, if you think about San Francisco and you think about the, the 60s, really a lot of the things that were happening in the 60s were started before that. The groundwork was getting laid in the 50s um, mm -hmm. in several ways, mm -hmm. right? So then there are a couple other spots too. There's the Pacific Northwest. So you mentioned grunge, right? And uh, right, right. That was really when when we think of recent memory of the Pacific Northwest getting hip. But Kerouac actually spent some time there when he needed to dry out from his alcohol binges. He uh, wanted to be a fire watcher in one of these towers and the in the Cascades. And so he wrote uh, during his time, just literally sitting by himself in one of these towers. You know, if hmm. you need a little interest, yeah, yeah. Some you know, so he he sort of with his fame and everything else, he sort of took himself out of circulation. 
so he could sort of rediscover what was authentic. But then also, Reed College, Portland, Oregon, was also a locale for some of the beat poets. So Gary Snyder, who I mentioned earlier, studied there. Some other folks involved in the movement, a guy named Philip Whalen, was there. Allen Ginsberg did readings on campus in 1955 and 1956, so right around the time Hal was being published. And I got to mention, so in Silicon Valley lore, Reed College is probably best known as the place Steve Jobs dropped out of, right? And then (laughs) dropped back into to take a calligraphy class, which um, inspired his love of design and letter forms, uh-huh, with the, uh-huh. especially with the Mac. So uh-huh. Gary Snyder and Philip Whalen also took calligraphy classes when they were attending Reed College. Now, whether or not Steve Jobs was a classmate, I don't know, but I, I highly doubt it because <laughs> he would have yeah, been a little, yeah. little too young then. Um, but, Todd, I can't leave out our own backyard here with one more place Black Mountain College in the mountains of oh, North Carolina, yes. right? Yes, yeah, kind of unsung hero of the of the um, art and design world of the time. Yeah, and there were so many people here who are household names in the arts who were teaching at this school. Buckminster Fuller, who we know for mm-hmm. the geodesic mm-hmm. dome, of course. John Cage uh, for his famous compositions. Many, many people. This was this little hamlet right outside of Asheville where a lot of the the Bauhaus guys, when they were kicked out of Europe during World War II, they ended up landing in North Carolina and started this art school. Yeah, and some of those, um, I think, were names you may have mentioned. Like, I think the de Koonings were there. Yeah. You didn't mention Joseph and Annie Albers. No, no, yeah. They were pretty famous. Walter Gropius, very connected to the Bauhaus and Rauschenberg. Um, so it was, I think, um, I think Black Mountain College started in the 30s and it actually closed like in the 50s, didn't it? Yeah, it was uh, around for about 25 years or so. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But but still talked about today. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It was highly influential. Um, and it's interesting, my um, my father-in-law, who actually attended RISD, but he was living in the mountains um, in the 50s. So he was very familiar with Black Mountain College and uh, very inspired by that. But um, by the time he was heading off to college, uh, it must have closed and he went on to RISD. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, RISD is a good fallback option, I guess. It's, it's not bad. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a perfect segue as we, as we sort of finish up. So we talked about the where, and obviously when you're talking about the where, you're also talking a little bit about the who. So, again, not the band. Don't get excited, Todd. I apologize. Oh, I, man. I Here we go again. I know. I know. I'm not going to get fooled again. I'll tell you that. Oh, man. A zinger. I like it. Okay, so we talked about Burroughs, we talked about Ginsburg, we talked about Kerouac, we talked about a whole host of poets and writers. Gorky, Pollock, de Kooning, Klein, all these abstract expressionists in, in New York, right? So all these guys, they were all working together. They were all doing these, as you mentioned, these emotionally driven, exploratory, expressive yeah. work it, you know it was really really a fertile time period it, yeah and you know i got so a question for you so yeah, yeah this is obviously we're talking counterculture and this is just my sort of limited understanding i thought the counterculture was rock and roll i thought that was chuck berry and elvis and fats domino <laughs> of right, that time. right 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 so right. so what how many countercultures did we have <laughs> i think what you regard as counterculture is really just culture. Okay, all right. Because if you think about it, th- this was stuff that, um, first of all, Elvis shaking his hips on the Ed Sullivan show caused a little bit of a fracas, <laughs> right? But there was never an extended obscenity trial over it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I'm sure, I'm sure the Beats were like rolling their eyes about like why is this kid getting so much. Um, notoriety here. <laughs> 
Well, I think you're exactly right, because going back to jazz, like we were talking about earlier for a moment, the Beats really saw the experience of African-Americans, of Black Americans, oh, what yeah. they referred to, um, you know, as, as the Negro, quote unquote. They really thought of that as the authentic experience. And they thought yeah. that jazz was very authentic. Things like the blues were very authentic. And so to see somebody like Elvis yeah, take that... Yeah, a white that, kid that was ripping off yeah, black culture yeah, was and, not and, authentic. Yeah, like he was sort of selling out, if you will, before selling out was a thing. Right. They thought, why couldn't these black artists be on TV and be on the radio and, and whatever? And some of them obviously were, of course. And so I think they they saw this as kind of a, a, a homogenized or compromised version of what could otherwise be a much more vibrant and expressive art form. Mm, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So I think that's really why these folks gravitated towards jazz to these underground clubs and places like Harlem. Because, you know, if you think about Elvis, white middle America was the intended audience for Elvis. Right, right. When these guys were sitting in a smoky underground jazz club in Harlem, they, as white people, as white males, they were not the intended audience. Right, right. And so for them, it was kind of, I think, refreshing and nice and just interesting, I think would be the, the word to use, that no one really cared they were there. They weren't going to compromise their art or do anything differently than they would be doing anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they just vibed on what they were witnessing. And so for them, that was very, very authentic, and they just absolutely loved it. Like, they thought that was the real America, not what was getting broadcast into living rooms. Uh, so so jazz musicians that you would see in clubs and, um, like, kind of smoky joints, that was... Uh, that was really the soundtrack to the beats. They were heavily influencing the beats and I guess influencing each other of the time. A hundred percent. Absolutely. So mu music was a big deal, not just literature. Yes. So if you think about the way a lot of these books are written, like On the Road, it was meant to be read out loud with a certain cadence. Poetry has a cadence right. to it, right? Literature has a cadence to it. And it was very much following this bop jazz kind of staccato sort of structure. It was very, very clever. It truly was kind of your, I don't know, your artistic cultural buffet where you've got your plate and you're, uh -huh, uh -huh. you're going down the, uh, you know, Todd, maybe there isn't a chocolate wonderfall. Maybe there is. I don't know. I, I know. I know in your buffet there is. <laughs> There is a chocolate wonderful, yes. Yeah, and there's and nothing else, right? Right. These guys are pulling off different things they like, combining it in different ways and doing something new. Yeah. There were no rules, right? If you're going on the Ed Sullivan show and you can't even show Elvis dancing, you can't have the camera on him dancing, I mean, that's pretty strict rules, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're just sitting in a club late at night just watching people go crazy playing jazz and yeah you might be on benzedrine you might be on a little bit of heroin hell the guys yeah, playing were yeah. probably on benzedrine and heroin or grass yeah. or whatever right so um it's just you're blending into the scene you're part of the scene you're appreciating the scene and so it really was just a way to stimulate all of this creativity so what's next elliot in this series of the beats well, I think since we've talked so much about jazz, we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't plumb the depths of jazz a little bit further. And actually, Todd, what we're going to do is talk about how jazz influenced the beats, and specifically, we're going to talk some jazz album art. Oh, cool. All right, cool. Well, while we wait to hear more about that, I think it's a good reminder to tip your bartenders mm -hmm. and while you're up there talking to the bartender uh do you mind picking me up another drink mine's running a little sure, low sure sure of course why wouldn't i what would be different from that from any other day right exactly now you know why i, I am a, such a fan of the beats because if yeah. if they are a bunch of freeloaders <laughs> they're like... freeloaders yeah <laughs> you're starting a movement called the freeloaders aren't you what do you mean starting i've been working on it for years <laughs> elliot strunk is the is the king of the the 
freeloader generation. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Come see me for expert tips. All right. Sounds good, Elliot. All right, everyone. We look forward to your emails, your letters, whatever you want to send us, your checks. Oh, yeah. Checks are good. But uh, keep them coming. Keep your reviews coming. We really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank you.